Bibles, I hope you do turn to Mark chapter 14. We're going to finish off uh, Mark 14 this week. And jump into a little bit of Mark 15 as we uh, continue through the book of Mark. Kind of entitled this series, You Are the Christ, as we, we've gone through the Gospel of Mark and we're going to uh, see this question, are you the Christ from Caiaphas this morning? And, and what that phrase means, just a, a really great, great passage in this. want to uh, continue to pray for Fayreen, of course, her family. Uh, most of you guys got the email that Fayreen did go and be with the Lord earlier this week and um, just continue to pray for the, the answers in that. And um, we uh, we welcomed Samuel Lauren to the world this week as well, and so uh, continue to pray for Stacy, for Mom, she's doing well, and um, grandparents, Grandma, Grandpa, and and for little Samuel. This is great, Sarah. You're still with child back there. It's a good it's a good cell phone prop, you know. <laughs> I always thought you got like a free napkin placemat right there. You eat whatever you want when you're pregnant anyway, right? So, Guys, just bear with me and keep turning to Mark chapter 14 <laughs> this week, this, week ago, this morning. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, uh, you're just such a great God, and um, we thank you for your word. Lord, um, just think of how privileged we are, the great saints of the faith in the Old Testament, and uh, some even in the new just had no complete written revelation of who you were and uh, what you've done in this world and what you are doing, what you will do. And we have that. Lord, I pray that it would strengthen our faith. Um, we make a, a special time of, of looking into your word. We, we gear these sermons around your word. We try to stay in the text as much as possible because it's only there uh, that we find the power for life change, for transformation more and more into the image of your Son. Lord, we have uh, a high regard for your word because we have a high regard for your authority in our lives. Um, we want your control, not our control. We want your sovereignty, um, not our manipulations. God, uh, help us to depend on you more and more each day as, as we look, as we sit, as we meditate on your word. God, we thank you for it. Help us to be like a tree that is firmly planted by streams of water. Fathers, we look at this passage this morning. Help us to uh, uh, just flee from this tendency to control and, and manipulate and scheme our way through life. Help us to see uh, Jesus as a great example of, of what to do when things don't go your way in life and just trust you wholeheartedly and completely. We ask, Father, that you would do this even this morning. And it's in the name of your Son that we pray. Amen. Well, as a 16-year-old, there was nothing more than I wanted than a driver's license. The problem was there was nothing less than my parents wanted for me to have one. The other problem was that my birthday that year fell on July 4th. Um, Birthday falls on July 4th every year, in case you guys were wondering, but... (laughs) The DMV is closed on July 4th, and so I turn 16. It's this great day. I can finally go and get my independence as a young adult, drive a car, and it's closed. They just take it away completely. I had passed my driver's education class. I passed my written examination. The last thing I had to pass was my driver's test. Uh, Mom and dad weren't interested in giving me the keys to the car. Surprise, surprise. And so the scheming began in my life. Um, late at night, uh, found the spare keys for my mom and dad's white Buick Century. Went to Walmart when you could copy a key for 75 cents. For a dollar and 50 cents, as a 15 year old kid, I went and copied my parents' keys to the car, uh, knowing that someday maybe I could use these keys to the car to, to do, to drive like we all love to do. I scheduled my driver's test. On my own accord, didn't ask mom and dad, just made sure mom and dad were at work when the driver's test was going to take place. My mom drove to work that morning in our white Buick Century. I drove about an hour behind her in my bike. 
And I waited for her to park the car at work, pulled up the bike, locked it on the bike stand, took the keys that I had copied, took the car out of there back to my house. The other problem I had was that I knew I needed an accompanied adult to take this driver's test. And so I called my sister. My sister was a schemer just as much as I was a schemer, and so she was game for this. Uh, me and my sister left to the DMV without my parents ever knowing that I was going to get my driver's test, and I came back with the driver's license. And that night at dinner table, I said, Dad, I'm taking the car to go get something to eat. He said, you don't have a license. I said, read it and wait, Pops. He says, you're not on the insurance policy. Read that and weep. And I thought, oh, okay. Uh, Mom said, how'd you get your license? And everything from there is a complete blur. I don't remember remember anything. Uh, (laughs) The whole plan was one big elaborate scheme. In dark places where no one was looking, I plotted and I schemed my way to a driver's license. We're going to look at one of the worst schemes in the history of scheming. That being the trials of Jesus in the gospel, and especially in the gospel of Mark. Listen to Ephesians 5, verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Jeremiah 4, verse 14. God asks his people, how long will you harbor up wicked schemes. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 29. This I have discovered. God made humankind upright, but they have sought out many evil schemes. The word for scheme in the New Testament is closely related to the word for crafty. Scheming is carried out specifically by two people, and schemes does not happen. This word does not occur very often in the New Testament. Scheming is carried out by two people in the New Testament. Satan and false teachers. In the list of sins that the New Testament labels that schemers would go by, we have deceivers, malicious, inventors of evil, and swindlers. Unfortunately, the the church is not immune from its schemers. Nothing will elicit dark schemes in dark places like church conflict. Secret meetings, Private emails, closed doors, late hours of the night have marked schemes in the church more often than we would like to admit. And as we look at these these trials of Jesus, my admonition is simply to to beware of scheming in your life. Uh, We're going to see three things in this text. Beware of plotting in dark places, chapter 14, verse 53 through 65. Beware of playing in high places, chapter 15, verse 1. And finally, beware of pleasing in politics, chapter 15, verse 2 through 15. Behind every scheme of man lies a prideful, manipulative desire for control. A.W. Tozer's got a, a wonderful quote. He says, people want the benefits of the cross, but not the control of the cross. We want to be the boss of our own lives. People who love to scheme love control. Those of us that have control issues have a deeper authority issue with the authority of God. Now, Mark in this gospel is going to give us uh, three trials that we're going to see Jesus go to. The first one is before Caiaphas uh, at the end of chapter 14 here, verse 53 through 65. Next, he will lead us to the Sanhedrin. In just one verse, we will see kind of a a summary statement of a trial that Jesus goes to before the religious council, the Sanhedrin there. And then finally, we'll see a a final trial before Pilate in chapter 15, verse 2 through 5. Really on down through 15 is the, uh, I I think that's that's one trial. Sometimes people divide this out a little bit differently. Uh, if you look in all the gospel accounts, there's there's probably six trials. If at least five or six is what scholars will ultimately suggest. Uh, the gospel of John adds a first trial before Annas, the high priest. And this is John 18, verse 12 and following. Annas is uh, like the godfather. His son sits as a high priest. His uh, son-in-law sits as a high priest after that. he has Annas has three generations of high priests that serve in Israel, in Jerusalem. Anything that you want to occur as far as religion and politics go would at some point in time in the Gospels have to go through Annas. 
And really, if you want to understand the trials to their depth and to their uh, details to get the most out of them, you go back to John and you read a lot about Annas and how he's really controlling everything uh, behind the scenes. Luke, of course, the Gospel of Luke will add a trial before Herod. Uh, this is mainly, scholars just think that at some point in time, Herod being the most powerful man in Judea at that point, point in time, Jesus was going to have to go in front of Herod. And just, Herod had an interest to see who this guy was. Um, most scholars will suggest that Jesus was actually tried twice by Pilate. One time he kind of finds him innocent. The next time is the Barabbas account. And we'll read about the Barabbas account toward the end of, uh, of the sections that we look at in in uh, chapter 15 this morning. All these trials are a huge sham and just a mockery of justice. The political leaders all pass Jesus away because nobody can find fault in him. He's innocent of all these charges that they're bringing against him. This is a, a kangaroo court is what we call this. Every intention is taken to find justice, to show justice, and all you find is just injustice everywhere. The whole thing is just a scam from the beginning to the end. Most of these trials happen at night. That is illegal. In the New Test, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and according to Roman law, most of these trials happen in residences, not in courtrooms. That's illegal. Most of them have paid witnesses, false witnesses, illegal, with judges making rulings, illegal, on a feast day, illegal. Jesus gets passed around more than a soccer ball because nobody can take a shot on goal as to far as far as what he is guilty of. Um, finally, Pilate will authorize the death sentence not to please the court but ultimately to please the people, to please the crowd, because he wants to be liked and revered by them. He feared men more than he feared God. Proverbs 24, 8 and 9, whoever plans to do evil will be called a schemer, and a foolish scheme is sin. Today I want you to see schemers in the light of Scripture and abandon this sinful tendency in some kind of way we all have this tendency to control, to manipulate, to, to scheme our way through life. Number one, and number one in your outline this morning, beware of plotting in dark places. Look at verse 53 of Mark chapter 14. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. Verse 54, and Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Verse 59. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. Problem number one, this trial before Caiaphas happens at his residence. Verse 54 says it's in the courtyard of the high priest. Trials in Jerusalem were supposed to take place, religious trials at a place called the courtyard of the hewn stone. This one doesn't, making it illegal. Problem number two, the witnesses, of course, don't agree. Deuteronomy 19 verse 15 says only on the evidence of two or three witnesses can a charge be established. And if you look through these verses that we just read, very cursory, just point out a few things that are repeated. Verse 56, false witnesses. Testimony did not agree. Verse 57, false witnesses. Verse 59, testimony did not agree. Problem number three, this trial happens at night. How do we know that? Look at verse 15, chapter 15 verse 1. And as soon as it was morning, everything that happened from the Last Supper, Jesus with his disciples, Judas' betrayal, Gethsemane, this first trial before Caiaphas, all of it happens at night. And again, that is illegal. Uh, when I was a teenager, I was supposed to be home at certain hours of the night. We called it curfew at our house. And if you go to Ponca Bible Camp and you go to camp during the summer, you will have to be in bed. The lights will go out at a certain hour. We call that lights out at Ponca. Now that I'm a parent, my parent, my kids go to bed at eight o'clock. We call that bedtime at our house. There are certain things 
that should not take place at certain hours during the night. Nighttime is for sleeping, not for conniving. And this is exactly what happens. And, and just so this can touch home a little bit, uh, more, more pointedly, I want you to listen to what, what, what one man says. Those who are the most particular in shadows are the most shallow in substance. Y'all remember Nicodemus when he came to Jesus in John chapter 3? Remember when he came? He came at night because he didn't want to upset anybody. Anybody let him know what he was doing. Remember when Haman erected his gallows for Mordecai in the book of Esther? Haman builds the 50-foot gallows all at night. And that's the night that the king, Ahasuerus, can't sleep. Uh, probably because he was hearing the banging and the clanging from the gallows going up. The Corleones, Godfather, went to the mattresses at night because that's when things get really interesting. We got a word in our language for stuff like this. It's called shady. Shady things happen in dark places, in dark corners where there are whispers, secrets, and closed doors where nobody wants to know what's going on, and it is all related to sin and, and difficult things. John 3, verse 20, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his works be exposed. Sin happens when people plot at night. This trial is shady, it is illegal, and everything happens in the dark hours of the night. Look at verse 60 of your text. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? Verse 61, but Jesus remained silent and made no answer. Jesus remains silent because his testimony doesn't stand in a court of law. In a Roman court, the testimony of a defendant does not stand. Our courts are the exact same way. Jesus will show himself more upright and lawful than the very high priest he goes before who asks for his testimony. Look at the end of verse 61. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Caiaphas cannot get him on a political charge, so now he turns to a religious charge. But the high priest, if they operate justly, they don't make rulings. Their job is to secure a fair trial. This is a kangaroo court from start to finish. Verse 62, Jesus said, I am, speaking of the Christ, the Son of the Blessed, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming with the clouds of heaven. In other words, check Daniel 7, Mr. Caiaphas, to me is given authority, dominion, you will see thrones, you will see a great high court, you will see the ancient of days, and he will give authority not to you or not to any other high priest in Israel or in Jerusalem, he will give authority to me because I am. And I have the authority, and I have an eternal kingdom. Verse 63, the high priest tore his garments. So what further witness do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. Beware of plotting in dark places. Number two in your outline this morning. Beware of playing in high places. We're going to skip over the end of chapter 14. I'm going to come back to that uh, next week. We'll talk about Peter's denials. Um, Understand that Mark places the denials of Peter right in the midst of all these kangaroo courts for a reason. While Jesus is wrongfully tried from above, he will be denied from below by his closest followers, his closest disciple. Look at uh, Mark 15, verse 1. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and they led him away and they delivered him over to Pilate. You've got two options for what's going on in chapter 15, verse 1 here. Some say that this was its own trial. Uh, We're just getting a, a glimpse of a whole trial right here in one verse of the gospel of Mark. 
Uh, cross references here are Matthew 27 verse 1 and Luke 22 verse 66 through 71. There is definitely a trial that goes before the Sanhedrin and this could be Mark's account of that. Others say that this is simply a summary statement that brings us back to what happened the verses that we just read earlier in chapter 14. I think the Sanhedrin held its own trial here because the politicians keep passing Jesus off. They've got to do their own due diligence and find him guilty of something to get him hanged and to kill this guy. Caiaphas can't get him on any political charge. All he has is a religious charge. The Jewish leader's hope will lead to treason before a Roman court. Pilate passes him off to Herod. Herod passes him back to Pilate. Pilate will, in essence, pass him back to the people, again, because nobody can find anything that is that is guilty or anything that is wrong with this man and with this God who is Jesus Christ. Notice uh, chapter 15, verse 1. The chief priests held a consultation with the elders and with the scribes. You've got to pay t- close attention to prepositions in your Bible. Almost every other time in the Gospel of Mark, When the chief priests are mentioned, they are mentioned with and the scribes and the elders. The chief priests are are taking a lead role here and using their religion to play games in high places and to manipulate and to connive. Further, Mark adds this description at the end of this text that the whole council was together on this. This is no small group of people. In the Gospel of Mark, one commentator says this, the phrase the whole council does not permit one to interpret Mark to mean a small group of the Sanhedrin membership. This is everybody coming together for the sole purpose of indicting Jesus and trying to find something against him. A lot of people give the Jews a hard time for killing Jesus. We know you have this anti-Semitism, especially in America. Make no mistake about it. It's the religious leaders who are specifically manipulating and scheming and driving Jesus to the cross. Notice your uh, three verbs at the end of verse 1, chapter 15. They bound Jesus, they led him away, and they delivered him over. Delivered him over in the Gospel of Mark is the same verb they use of John the Baptist when he was delivered over. Judas, when he delivered over Jesus through betrayal. Jesus being delivered over to sinful men when he prophesies about this event before it occurs. And it's the same term that God will use to deliver over his son to death. Mark 10, 45. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to deliver over his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, under the control of sinners is actually Jesus under the control of God. Uh, the Gospel of Mark has a great phrase when it talks about this. You would have no authority unless it had been given to you from above, is what Jesus will say to Pilate in the Gospel of Mark. Brandy and I were in a horrendous uh, church situation in our past. One of the most shocking aspects of everything that we went through was how people began to use their religion when it was convenient and play games with their religiosity, playing games in high places. The pastor was uh, faced with some moral issues that were extremely troubling where we were. It all came down to the good old congregational vote. Um, And oh my, that Sunday, you had never seen that church packed with as many people as there came out that Sunday for this congregational vote. Behind the scenes, in dark places when nobody knew about it, Uh, This pastor had gone and he had called up everybody who had ever darkened a door into the entryway of that church and called them onto the church and said, my church leadership is against me. I need you to come for this congregational vote so we can shut this down and that truth could come out of this whole situation. We came, we came to find out that manipulation, conniving and scheming was just, um, the normal way that things were done. Martin Luther King Jr. says the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. Another man has said a leader quickly learns that anytime he chooses to sit on his convictions, he naturally upsets others who stand on their conveniences. Christianity is not something that we use when it's convenient. 
It's something we live when we are convicted by the truth. The Sanhedrin will pass Jesus to a man who is first mentioned right here in the Gospel of Mark, who goes by the name of Pilate. And Pilate was appointed by the Emperor Tiberius to rule in Judea for about 10 years, from A.D. 26 to 36, at the turn of the century there. Pilate is referred to in general terms as a governor. Specifically, he is a prefect of Judea. Uh, they put Pilate there, Roman authorities put Pilate there to do a job that nobody wanted to do. They kind of uh, gave him this responsibility over these people that they really didn't care about. In other words, Pilate was a puppet. He was a pawn. He did exactly what Herod wanted him to do, what Tiberius wanted him to do at that time. He will be the Roman authority that is most responsible for the death of Jesus. And we will read about this as the account continues. Beware of plotting in dark places, playing in high places, and pleasing people in politics. Look at Mark 15, verse 2. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. Now the chief priests come to Pilate, bringing their accusations to him. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. And that word for amazed is the same description of the people after Jesus performs miracles in the Gospels. That he leaves them amazed and they marvel at Jesus. Of course, this is what you call the buckshot approach. Let's throw a a bunch of accusations against Jesus and let's see if any of them stick before Pilate. There are two double negatives in these verses, one from the lips of Pilate, verse 4, not answer nothing. Do you not answer nothing to them? And one from Mark, verse 5, but Jesus no longer answered nothing. Listen to Isaiah 53, verse 7, because Mark is intentionally drawing us to this aspect that as many accusations, as many things were thrown out, Jesus remains silent over and over again. Isaiah 53, verse 7, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers, he is silent, and so he opened not his mouth. Look at verse 6, Mark 15. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas, Barabbas you've seen the uh, passion of the Christ. And a crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them as, as he usually did. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. Again, Pilate cannot find anything against this guy. And he thinks the chief priests just have a pride issue here. They're threatened by him. Verse 11, but the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him released. Have, have them release for them Barabbas instead. Pilate will ask three questions to the crowd here with Barabbas. The first question is verse 9. Second, verse 12. The third question is in verse 14. The crowd will respond each time. Verse 11 is the response, the first response. Verse 13 and verse 14, respectively. Another threefold repetition, echoing the threefold denials of Peter, the three prayers in Gethsemane. Every gospel in your New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, has the account of Barabbas. And I don't think this is coincidental. I think this is uh, detrimental to how we understand the, the gospel account of Jesus throughout Scripture. We get these two characters um, compared next to one another. We've got Jesus on one side. We've got Barabbas on the other. And if you've seen the Passion of the Christ, they do a, a wonderful job in this. They bring out Barabbas and his chains and just a uh, just an awful looking guy. You can tell they dragged him right out of prison. Um, just nothing good about him whatsoever. And, and then you've got Pilate right in the middle. And then you've got Jesus on this other side, just this silent Jesus who is beaten. He's, he's been torn or he can barely stand there. And then you're going to compare now Barabbas between Jesus with Pilate right in the middle. In narrative, when we see this happening, 
we should pause and we should compare these two characters. Jesus on the one hand and Barabbas on the other. Jesus, of course, was wrongfully accused. Barabbas was rightfully accused. Jesus was innocent. Barabbas was guilty. Jesus was a a good citizen. Barabbas was a murderer. Barabbas is what is called a character foil in narrative. He comes on the scene almost as quickly as he is gone. Barabbas is there to multiply the innocence of Jesus and the sinfulness of the high priests and the religious leaders. Another reason why Barabbas is there is to foreshadow the beauty of the cross and the substitutionary death of Christ. Jesus becomes a substitute for Barabbas. He took the punishment that Barabbas deserved. This is the just for the unjust, as First Peter will say. The righteous for the sinner. The holy for the unholy. The Christ for the criminal. And if we see ourselves anywhere in this text, as we read the trials, these kangaroo courts, we see ourselves in Barabbas. In the gospel, Jesus took the penalty that we all deserved. He took on the wrath of God that we should be subjected to. He took on a criminal's death that we deserve to die. And when you believe in the gospel, you believe that you have a substitute who took on the wrath of God for you in your place instead of you, that you might have the righteousness of God simply by placing your faith in him. Look at verse 12. And again, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with this man that you call? the king of the Jews. And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to him, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him, crucify him. I'm a movie watcher. I love to watch the lives of characters unfold in movies. I'm greatly satisfied by the portrayal of people in movies. Usually a good movie leaves me in awe of men and what they can do with the hero characters. But I also love nature. Uh, and the two aspects of nature I love are just God's beauteous creation. I've been to the Grand Canyon before. I've seen just the majestic beauty of God, and I've been to the ocean before. And when I go and I see creation, I see not only the beauty of God, but I see the power of God. And nature is a lot different for me than going to a movie. Movies leave me with a fear of man. Nature leaves me mostly with a fear of God. I want you to look at verse 15 in your text. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him over to be crucified. Pilate unquestionably wanted to please people instead of pleasing God. He feared being rejected by the people more than he feared being rejected by God. Ed Welch says people are our idol of choice. We worship people because we believe they have the power to give us something. With God reduced in our eyes, a fear of people will thrive. I want to conclude um, this text on these trials of Jesus and talking about scheming and, and all of these injustices that happen in the text with a a clarification and a caution as we think about Mark 14, 53 through Mark 15, verse 15. And the first is a clarification. And the first clarification I want to make is on one of the best doctrines of Scripture related to the gospel that we have in all of the Bible. The doctrine of the substitutionary death of Christ. This is a doctrine that goes back to the Old Testament. Uh, unblemished animals were sacrificed instead of sinners on the altar of God. The doctrine of substitution continues in the New Testament with two prepositions in the Greek. The first preposition is anti, it means instead of. The second preposition is huper, it means on behalf of. Simply put, the doctrine of the substitutionary death of Christ means that Christ died instead of us, on behalf of us. He took the punishment that we all deserve. The verses to defend the substitutionary death of Christ, the penal substitutionary death of Christ, are Deuteronomy 24, 16, Isaiah 43, 3 and 4, Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, Matthew 20, 28, Mark 10, 45, 
Romans 5, 6 through 8, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Galatians 3, 13, Titus 2, 14, 1 Timothy 2, 6, and 1 Peter 3, 18. The reason why I'm saying this is this is not a minor in Scripture. This is a major aspect of Scripture. This doctrine has been questioned in our area, and some of you know about this. The rebuttals suggest that God could not punish his own son to die a criminal's death because that would be child abuse. That position is held by postmoderns who want to make the cross more palatable, a soft view of the death of Jesus Christ. It's also held by feminists who fight for women's rights and children's rights. Some of the writers include Joanne Brown, Rebecca Parker, Darby Ray, and most significantly, a guy in England named Steve Chalk in his book, The Lost Message of Jesus. All that to say... Those who hold this view in our area did not make it up for themselves. Somebody else has propounded it and suggested it long ago, and it is in literature. Tom Schreiner, one of the finest New Testament scholars, says this view that rejects the penal substitutionary death of Christ on the cross overemphasizes the distinctions of the Trinity, and it fails to see that the Father grieves over the loss of his son. It reduces the death of Christ to minimizing human perspective. From our perspective, does it look like child abuse? Maybe. From the divine perspective, can we ever understand the penal substitutionary death of Christ? I don't think we can. We cannot understand it. This is such a mystery to us. Um, D.A. Carson, one of the best professors and evangelical voices of our time, the professor at Trinity, says this view does not qualify as serious scholarship when people question the substitutionary death of Christ. Charles Ryrie, clearly the Bible teaches that Christ's sacrifice was not a matter of sympathy, but a matter of substitution. Tom Schreiner says the theory of the penal substitution is the heart and soul of the evangelical view of the atonement. If there was ever a hill to die on in the church... The penal substitutionary death of Christ is one of those hills because the gospel is one of those hills that we're going to die on. Number two is a caution. More than anything else in this text, we see the religious elite spinning the wheels of manipulation to get what they want, to control this whole situation, to do with Jesus as they see fit. When I see and I read these trials... I see the desire and the sin of seizing power for yourself, pride, self-indulgence, control, and manipulation. One top psychologist has said, there are those whose primary ability is to spin wheels of manipulation. It is their second skin. And without these spinning wheels, they simply do not know how to function. This is a major problem in our culture. Go to the workplace. See the battles for middle management every once in a while, trying to climb the corporate ladder. Your best friend in the work environment is your best friend until they can get a promotion instead of you. Then all of a sudden, they're your worst enemy. Uh, Happened to to Brandy not too long ago, one of her jobs. Unbelievable. Um, Sometimes manipulation is disguised as unspoken rules. Some of you guys have had bosses, people over you, who have all these unspoken rules about what you should do and what you shouldn't do. You don't know what the rules are until you break them, right? In this system of manipulation, silence is golden. If you begin to talk about the problem, you are the problem. And so we manipulate, we control people. How do we fight this innate desire to manipulate, scheme, and to get what you want. How do you live when you're the victim of manipulation, even? My exhortation this morning is to trust more and control less. Trust God more. Control yourself less. In many ways, not that sounded really... Sometimes you say something and it just doesn't spin quite right. Self-control is a good thing, all right? So trust God more. Try to control less. In many ways, Jesus gives us an example of how to suffer well through manipulation and through trials. And those who suffer well know two things about the character of God. The first thing that those who suffer well know, the first thing that Jesus 
knew well when he suffered is the sovereignty of God. He trusted the sovereignty of God. Psalm 115 verse 3 is one of my favorite verses on the sovereignty of God. It goes something like this. Our God is in the heavens. He does as he pleases. Proverbs 16 verse 9. The heart of a man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his his steps. Michael Horton says God's majesty is revealed not only in his sovereignty over rising empires, but also in his tender concern for for falling sparrows, which leads me to my second point. If all we had was the awesome, powerful sovereignty of God, there might be very good reason to be terrified of him and to live in fear step by step and day by day in your Christian life. But the second thing about those who suffer well and can get through manipulation well that they understand about God is that God is good. God is not only great in his sovereignty, but God is also good in his treatment of those who love him. Psalm 34, verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. James chapter 1. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Uh, Millard Erickson has a great section in his theology on the attributes of God, and he talks about the greatness of God in the goodness of God. And we cannot understand the greatness of God, his all-powerful, sovereign nature, apart from the goodness of God along with that. And here's what Millard Erickson says. If God's qualities of greatness, his person, his all-powerful nature, his eternal nature, his spirit, his presence everywhere, and his unchanging imperfection were God's only attributes. He might conceivably exercise his power in a capricious or even a cruel fashion. But because God is good, as well as great, he can be trusted and he can be loved. And we have adopted that as part of our new statement of faith at Swiss Church. You can go online and you can read that about the character of God. As we move forward in the Gospel of Mark, um, we're coming to the crucifixion, the account of the crucifixion. Uh, Tommy Nelson's one of my, my favorite pastors, and, uh, and he said, the crucifixion is not a, a passage that you preach. The crucifixion is a passage that you read, and you just let it soak in, the emotions and the details of the text. And so I'm not going to try to preach this too much. We're going to come back next week. We're going to look at the denials of Peter. And we're going to find out who we really are and, uh, in terms of who we think we are, but who we really are. Um, and the week after that, we'll take a look at the crucifixion. I think it'll be Thanksgiving that week. And so uh, a great timing for a Thanksgiving passage as we, as we think about the crucifixion of Jesus. As you leave today, I want you to remember to pray for Gary. Uh, he's going through a tough time with shingles right now. Pray for Steve and Debbie. Of course, uh, Tayana and Eli are going to be at the entrance with some uh, offering buckets. If you want to give a special love donation for Steve and Debbie, the missions committee would like to give you the opportunity to do that. And so please do on your way out. Also remember our offering boxes are in the back as you go. Uh, let me pray and, uh, and we'll be done this morning. Father in heaven, again, we, um, we look at these trials and, uh, the injustices that are done to you, we, we marvel. We are in awe of your uprightness, of your goodness through it all, of your ability to trust the Father, even in tragedy, even when you know what's ahead of you. You still trusted the Father. You are completely in his care and in his sovereign concern. Help us to understand that for our own lives, too. Um, help us not to manipulate our way through life and try to control aspects that we have ultimately have no control over. Help us to trust you more and control less. And I am speaking to myself this morning. Um, help us to, to look at your authority and your, your sovereignty over our lives and just marvel in your goodness to us and know that whatever comes about in our life, however grave, however dark, However manipulative people want to be, you are sovereign. You care about us. You love us. There is no temptation that you bring to us that we cannot overcome through the power of the Holy Spirit even, Lord. And so we, we ask for the uh, um, supernatural ability to trust you, to suffer well through life. 
Father, we ask it to you through through the Father, uh, by the Son, and by the Spirit as we leave this morning. Amen.